Praise the Lord. Let's start off with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before your presence, God. I thank you, God, for giving us another opportunity to come before your presence, Lord. I pray that you would speak through me. I pray that you would anoint me, Lord. I pray that you would touch each and every single person here. I pray, Lord God, that you would help us, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth today and to learn from your word, Lord. And in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. It reads, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Most of the time, when money is talked about in church, we are told to be content with whatever we have. But this command can actually encourage complacency instead of true biblical contentment. Being content is usually defined as being satisfied with whatever you have. And it's often supported by scriptures like this one. But what is Paul saying here? Is Paul saying that you shouldn't try to improve your current situation? that you shouldn't further your education, try to get a better job? Are we just supposed to passively sit by and watch life go by? What about our call to be the salt and light of the earth? How can we be content without being complacent or lazy? And this is something that I've been struggling with, and I've been thinking about it a lot. Recently, I've been seeing a a lot of social media posts that say something along the lines of, the most dangerous place you can be is the same place you were in last year. And that got me thinking. Because if we're supposed to be content, then shouldn't you be content with where you were last year? And I think to start, you need to look at when not to be content. Because I think the Bible is very clear on when you're not supposed to be content. Let's look at Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. This is a good example of someone who is satisfied with what they had when they shouldn't have been. It reads, Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest some money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. Now notice, the master did not give any instruction on what the servants were supposed to do with the money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account on how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. Master is full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I'll give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. Master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I'll give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant, with one bag of silver, came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant, if you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant, gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, Take the money from the servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. And this next verse is the key verse. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The servant who received one talent was content with what he had. But should he have been? He saw no reason to put his money to work 
despite knowing the intent of his master. All three servants knew what their master intended for them to do with the, with the money. So when the master returned, as we read, he rebuked the servant. Now, this is where we don't want to be content. We don't want to end up like the servant who is content with his one talent. Instead, we need to be persistent and faithful, even in the smallest of things, because what we do now doesn't, doesn't apply to just today. It also applies to eternity. And that's the kind of vision we need to have. We need to have an eternal vision. You see, when we live life in the light of eternity, we make decisions differently because we see life from a different perspective. We see life from an eternal perspective. Instead of just going into the office to put in your hours, we start our work every day knowing that we are glorifying God in some unique way. Think about it. Computer scientists design systems and apps that make our lives more efficient. Accountants ensure ethical dealings and help businesses and individuals know where their liabilities and assets and equities are going. Secretaries do important administrative work that helps organizations run more efficiently. Now, on their own, individuals in these professions can't do much to represent the kingdom of God. But when they all work together and do their individual jobs to the best of their abilities, we see how God uses all of us to cultivate his creation. For Christians who work in nonprofits, public service, or here at church doing any sort of ministry, we are seeking to produce better ideas, to serve others more meaningfully, to further our organization more efficiently. And when we go out into the world and we do for-profit jobs, we are offering high-quality goods and services with the intent of improving other people's lives. When we do our utmost to create value and improve the creation by using the resources that God has given us, we are being like the two-talent and the five-talent servants. You, each and every single person seated here, you have something to offer the world. And through the gifts and talents that God has given you, you create something that was better than what you were born into. Because we all have an eternal legacy to leave. These gifts and talents position you to contribute to the flourishing of the world. Whether you use your gifts to go into law or construction or music, whatever you do, you have the opportunity to create something that can, one, glorify God, and two, improve other people's lives. But how do we do this? How do you pursue excellence as God's servant while also being content in every situation. Is that not a paradox? Is it possible to achieve that balance between not making your job your idol while also not being lazy? Paul tells the Philippians that he's learned the secret to being content in every situation. And this is Paul's secret. Paul's secret is that he is always striving to do what God has called him to do. And because of that, He's content. At the end of the day, Paul knows in his mind he has done everything he could to be faithful to God's call on his life. Amen. Let's look at Philippians chapter 3, verses 12, and 12 to 14. It says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. This is Paul's secret. If we want to experience this contentment that Paul is talking about in chapter 4, we need to use all the gifts and talents God has given us through our individual callings to bring the maximum return for our master. Because the thing is, real contentment is not being satisfied with where you are or where what you have. Real contentment is working diligently to glorify God, serve the common good, and further the kingdom of God in everything we do. That's how we achieve contentment. There's a quote that says, peace of mind is a direct result of self-satisfaction in knowing you did your best to become the best that you are capable 
of becoming. This is the self-satisfaction that Paul is talking about when he says he's content, whatever the circumstances. Because he knows that he's constantly striving to do what God has called him to do, regardless of the circumstance. There's no complacency in Paul's contentment. And there shouldn't be any in ours either.